So this is part three in my risk management project series. In this video, we're gonna be talking about building a risk register. If you haven't watched part one or two, you need to watch that as it's a kind of foundation to this video and some of the stuff in here won't make sense unless you watch that first. I will be building the risk register in Google Sheets as I think it's a little bit more colorful than the stuff you can do in Notion. And that will be shareable and linked in the description. We aren't going to get technical yet. We're still talking about how risk management works. And in later videos, we'll be diving into IT risk management and operational risk management and actually look at some different risks related to IT. But at this stage, we're just kind of understanding the high level process of risk management, the calculations that are done, and this is qualitative risk management at the moment. We're looking at a qualitative risk register. Anyway, let's get into it. Okay, so here we go. This is my second time filming this because I forgot to press record the first time and talked for ages before realizing I wasn't recording it. So anyway, let's go. So the first page is just a risk acceptance criteria and this isn't the actual register. This is just an extract of some of the stuff that was in the policy section seven. 8.3 and if you look at this kind of acceptance criteria you've got one to four and if you look at this it's actually one to twelve that we've accepted and this is a problem this is one of the changes we're going to be making to the policy because now that we've actually got stuck in and done a bit of risk management and risk register stuff we realize that one to four is a bit unrealistic and it's a bit difficult and this is a common issue someone writes a policy at a high level people at the operational level actually doing the work think you know what this doesn't work that's unrealistic that's not in alignment with what we should be doing and it results in a change back up in policy which we will be doing i did do that on purpose just to illustrate this and have some changes to add to the policy amongst other things anyway you can ignore this this is just informational the risk register itself is here now there's so many different types of risk registers, so many columns you can add, so much stuff you don't need to have in some cases, and they can look very different. But generally, this is what they look like. Now, there are some mandatory things that you need to capture, like the risk owner, your actual risk response, you know, a description of what the risk actually is, what you're doing about it, which is a control description, which I've caught here. And then we've got this inherent residual and target, which we'll get into in a minute. So first column is just a reference ID. It's just a unique number. Yeah, because as we add, delete, change, modify the sheet, these role numbers aren't going to be sufficient. We need to actually capture a unique identifier for each risk. I'm the risk owner, so those are my initials. This is our risk response strategies. Now, this is the mobile phone falling out of pocket risk. You know, we're not getting onto IT and security risks just yet. That will be in later videos. However, these are the four different options we have, accept, transfer, mitigate, and avoidance. And I've picked the same risk with four different things we're doing and this isn't realistic because in reality you might have this risk once and you just decide to mitigate it or accept it or transfer it or whatever avoid it you know you're not going to have the same risk with four different things you're doing because it's not really a response is it it's yeah anyway this is just for informational and learning project purposes so the phone falling out the pocket my pocket's too big the risk is going to get damaged what can we do about it now Firstly, the accept, as I've talked about before, is just, yeah, I'll accept the risk. If it falls out, it falls out. I'll have to buy a new one. Problem is, it's expensive. I don't really want to. So maybe we can transfer the risk. How do I transfer the risk? Well, primarily, why don't I just buy Apple Care? insurance so if it falls out i'll get a new phone i don't have to pay for it that's transferring the risk of the damage the financial impact of my phone falling out of my pocket to an insurance provider now although that is possible there is stuff that i can't transfer to them so for example if i had pictures of my family or something else that wasn't backed up to the cloud and that was broken my family might get really angry with me ruins my reputation because now they see me as some incompetent guy who wears small trousers and has big phones and can't look after their pictures so even though 
the insurance provider is paying for the price of the phone. They can't help with my reputation. And that's one of those kind of risks that it's very difficult to transfer your reputational risks and a few other things, but that's a very common one that I'm just using as an example. Now, mitigation, now this is where we actually want to be. We want to be doing stuff to mitigate the risks, to decrease the impact, the probability of it happening. So how I've done that is I can buy a pouch, I can buy a bag, I can put the phone in there, I can zip it up securely. That way, it's not in my pocket. There's less of a chance of it falling out my pouch or my bag or my man bag or whatever you want to call it than there is of my pocket. Risk avoidance is essentially taking a step to not even be exposed to the risk at all, i.e. in this scenario, if I don't leave my house at all, if I was a hermit, if I just stayed at home, then there's no risk my phone's falling out my pocket because it's always going to be on my bedside table or wherever. So yeah, risk avoidance is essentially not being exposed to the risk. However, avoidance is not something you see very often because often in business, you have to take risks to be able to grow, to be able to make money. So yeah, risk avoidance is something you need to be aware of, but practically you don't really see often. And yeah, that's kind of the control description, the control title, i.e. the control is something you are doing to control the risk. That's kind of one way of looking at it. When we talk about control mapping, we're going to keep this blank for this video but the idea here is you link this to a security standard a framework something like NIST ISO 27001 or whatever kind of security framework or standard they might have a specific control within there that actually deals with your risk so instead of creating your own bespoke control that you want to do you just pull it out of the framework and you use that and that should be your primary kind of thing that you do as opposed to creating random controls that you think are best you know look at other companies with that risk and organizations etc and understand what frameworks and security standards deal with those specific risks and implement those recommended controls or baseline standard best in practice controls whatever anyway now the status is just kind of like a status update is it done is it in progress is it on hold is it not applicable because we're not doing anything about it so yeah these are just kind of some of the options you can have Again, you know, this can look very different wording wise, but generally, you know, you want to be able to update stuff. Also, like some of the funky stuff you can do is like add comments to specific things that so you might have like comments for the risk or whatever it may be. Anyway, this is where we're going to get a little bit more interesting because we're looking at the numbers. Now, the inherent risk, because it's the same risk, is going to be the same for these, but the different things we do impacts and changes a residual risk and the risk target. Now, if you don't know any of these terms, you should watch my first video. Just quickly, inherent risk is where we started at. Impact is very high if I lose my phone. The probability is very high because that's why it's a risk in the first place. My pocket's too small, my phone's too big. So that's just a five, five, top, worst thing that can ever happen in my life. Lose access to your phone. Catastrophic scenario. Big 25, red, red, red. Now the residual is what I'm left with after I've done something about it. So if I've bought mobile phone insurance, okay? Now it doesn't decrease the probability because my phone can still fall out of my pocket as often as it does. I haven't actually done anything to decrease the chances of it falling out of my pocket. However, what I have done is actually reduced the impact. So when it does fall out of my pocket, I don't have to pay a thousand pound for a new phone. Someone else will just pay for it. So the impact has been reduced, but there is still some impact because my reputation is still at stake because people might be angry at me for losing pictures that were only stored on my phone and not backed up to the cloud or whatever. So the residual risk is at 10, which is green. Our target is five though. So there are some things that you can do to reduce the impact in some scenarios, i.e. insurance in this case. However, if we look at the mitigate option of purchasing a pouch, now a pouch doesn't reduce the impact. If it drops out the pouch, it will still fall and break. So the impact's not actually been changed, but the probability has decreased because now it's less likely to fall out because of the zips and whatever else. So, so the other two ways you can kind of address risks is impact and probability. Sometimes both, I could have said, purchase a pouch and a new phone case. So there's kind of two controls or two things I'm doing there. The phone case would make it stronger, so it less break, i.e. reduces the impact. The pouch will reduce the probability, so that could make this a lot less. Now for this avoided thing, there's no residual 
because the inherent we've just decided not to do anything about it so we can kind of ignore this as a mute yeah not relevant one other thing i want to say is that you know as you get through companies that have long complex risk registers you want to make it look pretty you want to be able to tell a director or the ceo or the risk owner or high level the board of directors or whatever what is going on in the risk management function in five seconds how do you do that through charts and visualizations let's say we had 100 of these risks they're not going to have time to read every single one of them. They just want to know how many do we have in total? Where did we start? What's our current residual risk? Where are we at now, i.e. here? And what's our target? How far away are we from our target? Where do we want to be? So it's kind of the three-step flow of we started off here, we're here now, we want to be here in the future, and simple. Now, of course, you can have so many different ways you can visualize this and use data analysis tools and it gets a lot more complex for quantitative risk management etc but for now we've just kept it simple one nice neat tidy chart and there we go that's it in my next video we're actually going to be looking at some it risks i think having watched one two and three you understand how the policy works at a high level it's not perfect if you've watched my first second and third episode in this series so far you should by now understand the definitions how the policy and frameworks work how the documentation works at a high level and now you have an understanding of how the qualitative risk register is set up and works so pat yourself on the back congratulations thank you for getting this far you've kind of have the fundamentals of how risk management works now it's going to get a lot more interesting because now we're going to be looking at some it risks some security risks some project risks operational risks whatever it is process risks we're going to actually be looking at different things and how we would handle them in the real world so far i've just taught you how it works how it's set up and now we're going to dive deep and actually manage this as a corporate entity that actually handles risk management. So we're going to start from my next video with looking at some IT and security risks, a few different types, a little bit more detailed on some of the things we can do. So yeah, stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. Bunch of links in the description. Check them all out. And yeah, thank you for watching this. Thank you for all the likes, the comments, the subscribers. We hit 3,000 subscribers recently, so a big milestone. Thanks for that. And yeah, stay tuned, and I will see you in the next video. And if you've gotten this far and you haven't liked the video, then I'm going to cry later. So yeah, don't do that to me. Like the video, show some love. Subscribe, comment, interested to hear your thoughts, and I'll see you in the next one.